Hello and welcome to episode one of my Making a Platformer in Bevy series. In this series, I intend to make a fairly simple platformer using the Bevy game and showing off a range of levels of how to do things, starting from the absolute basics where you don't know anything about Bevy, which will be primarily this episode. I'll then do other episodes where I might introduce more complex topics that require more of Bevy systems or implementing and using other plugins. The episodes will be denoted by the number of Bevy coins in the left side of the screen there. You can see episode one, one Bevy coin. I wanna make each episode somewhat self-contained in that I'll be covering how to implement whatever I'm talking about from beginning to end in each episode. But having seen previous episodes will definitely help because you'll have more of an idea of what's going on in the game and why I might be implementing these systems. This series was inspired by a comment on my very first Bevy video that points out in 0.9, you have to use a different name for the camera than you did back when I made that video in. To get started with your Bevy project, there are a few things that most Bevy projects should have done immediately. This is things like including the latest version of Bevy in your cargo tomal. I also recommend including the Bevy editor, please. This is an unofficial version of an editor for Bevy that uses Bevy EGUI to generate an overlay that allows you to edit and manipulate components at runtime. It's also mature enough that it allows you to create custom windows if you need to edit and manipulate resources yourself. Another important thing for newcomers to Bevy to know is that you should add profile.dev.package.star opt level equals three into your cargo.toml. What this does is tell the compiler to optimize all dependencies to opt level three without turning off all the debug functionality. Since you're not likely to often be recompiling Bevy itself since new versions only come out every few months, this shouldn't slow down your compile time since your code itself will be compiled in only opt level one. But this does, however, mean that you don't run into bottlenecks within Bevy itself. I personally discovered this when I was trying to make a game that did mesh rendering. Bevy would start running really slow when you have hundreds of thousands of mesh, in, but only in opt level one, but not in opt level three. In opt level three, I went back up to Bevy, limiting my frame rate to 60 FPS. Once your cargo.toml is set up, the first thing to do in your rust.main is to include the Bevy prelude. I personally recommend just starring it to include all of the prelude since you will use a lot of this functionality without even knowing. Then in your main function, create a new app and add the default plugins. This is also where you need to add the editor if you'd like that to be in your game too. Then simply run the application. The default plugins include everything you need to set up your basic game loop at 60 FPS and render a window to the screen. Bevy can take a while to compile for the first time, especially in op level three. On my computer, it's upwards of six minutes. So while this is happening, you can go to the link in the description and download the resources of itch.io that I'll be using for this project. These resources are free to download and in the public domain. If you don't like the resources I picked for this series, feel free to look on itch.io for other resource packs that you can use. When you've downloaded all your images and exported them into your assets file, hopefully by then, Bevy will have finished compiling and you should have had your Bevy window appear. The next step is to add a camera to Bevy. This is so that Bevy knows how to to render. Since we're making a 2D game, we will add a 2D camera. This is done by making a function that takes in the commands system parameter, and then we simply say commands.spawn camera 2D bundle default. This will spawn a default camera configured for 2D in the center of our game world, facing into the Z coordinate. To add this function as actually part of our application, we go back to our main function where our application was described, and then we add somewhere between new and run dot add startup system and pass in spawn camera as the parameter. The next step is to create our player so that we actually have something to render. To do this, I create a player struct and derive component on it. This struct has no information since this will just be used to mark which entity in our world is our player for other systems to then query later. To spawn the player, we create a function like we did for the camera that takes in the commands parameter. We also pass in a texture atlas resource. This can be done by using the res mute, which tells Bevy that we want a mutable reference to a resource. The generic type for this is assets with the generic type texture atlas. Assets are a resource that act like a hash map, allowing us to store references to our assets with handles. We then also need the asset server resource. 
This is done by wrapping it in the res type since we want an immutable reference to it. This allows other systems to run at the same time that also need the asset. If you get confused by any of the terminology I use in this video, you can go to my channel and watch the Bevy Basics series where most of these topics have been covered with their own video. Inside our system, we generate the texture atlas by calling from grid. This will slice up the texture we provide into a grid. This will take in an image handle, which we get from the asset server by loading the main character, the dust man, and then the idle animation. We then say that each cell in the grid is 32 by 32. This is done with a vec2 splat. We then state that our texture is 11 columns by one row, and that it has no padding and no offset. Once we have our texture atlas, we can spawn our player. We do this by spawning a tuple that contains a sprite sheet bundle and our player flag. Inside the sprite sheet bundle is our texture atlas handle. We obtain the handle by taking the texture atlas's resource and adding the texture atlas we just created. This will return a strong handle to that texture atlas that we can then provide to the sprite bundle. We then need to provide a texture atlas sprite. This can be left completely default. Once we've finished writing our spawn player function, we also need to add it to our application like we did the camera by adding a startup system. For the sake of brevity, I will cut out a lot of duplicate actions and we'll leave it up to you in order to work out how to do this. Also linked in the description is a link to my GitHub, which will have commits for basically every frame or at the very least each step that the frames represent. So if you get lost, you can always go there for help. Now when you run your game, you should see something that looks similar to this. If you now run the game, you'll end up with a screen like this. Your character standing in the middle of the screen, not moving. Because we have not implemented any logic, there is nothing more that the game can do but simply render the character in the middle of the screen. However, now we will add some animations. This requires some additional components. First is a sprite animation component. We use this to specify how many frames are in an animation and how long each frame lasts. We also have a second component called frame time. This indicates how long the current frame has been held. To make the system that actually handles the animation, we create a function that takes in the time and a query. In this case, we don't actually use our player flag since we want to be able to animate enemies as well using the same game logic. We need a mutable query since we will be editing some of the value. We will query a mutable texture atlas sprite so that we can increment the texture atlas. An immutable animation since we will not change how many frames are in the animation or how long they are held for. And finally, we will need access to the mutable frame time so that we can increment how long the current frame has been held. Inside the system itself, we will then do a for loop through each returned value in the query. This is done with the itimute, returning a tuple of those values, which we can then deconstruct into named variables that we can edit. We then increment the frame time of each entity by delta time, which is the time since the last frame. Check to see if the current frame time is greater than the length of time we're supposed to hold an animation frame for. If it is, we work out how many frames have passed by dividing that time by the length of frame time and then casting this down to a U size. We do this so that if there's a lag spike or a frame takes longer than a single frame of animation, we can skip forward a few frames, allowing for the animation to catch back up. This also means that we can play animations that may be faster than our refresh rate and we will not fall behind in the FPS by only being allowed to increment one frame. Then we increment the sprites index by the number of frames to go forward. This, however, may result in our sprite index being greater than the number of frames in the animation. If this is the case, we modulo the sprite's index with the length of the animation. This will reset the sprite back to zero. This is also done so that if we change what animation is being played and it does not have the same number of frames, the application will not crash by an index out of bounds. We then decrease how much time we've been on the current frame by the number of frames we skipped times by the length of each frame. This should result in our value ending back up within the range of one frame time. We then need to go back to where we spawned our player and make sure we include the sprite animation component and frame time component on them when we spawn them. For the sake of brevity, I will also no longer include when we go back and change previously spawned entities. You will also need to determine when this needs to be changed and go back and change it yourself. Again, the GitHub will be there for if you get lost. Now, if we reopen the game, we can see that the character has an idle animation. We still can't control the character, but they will sit there idling for the rest of time. So let's add some logic so that we can move our character. To move our character, for now, I'm gonna use a constant move speed rather than a resource. But it is possible to derive the player's move speed from the resource or include it as part of the player component. The move player is also the first time we use the player flag. We do this in our query for our mutable access to the transformer. After the comma, 
we declare with player. This means we will only return entities that have a transform and are flagged as players. This prevents us from moving all of our stationary objects and enemies in the same system that we move the player. If we did not have this flag, all entities in the world, including the camera, would move when we press the arrow key. We also need to take in the time resource again, since we don't want our character to move a fixed amount per frame, but instead a fixed amount per second. Because of this, we will need to know the time between frames to adjust our player's move speed by. We then also take in the resource inputs of key codes. This is Bevy's way of tracking what keyboard buttons have been pressed. There is also a mouse button variant if you'd like to track mouse clicks. I also have a mini series on my channel covering what user input Bevy provides by default. In our system, we use .single to extract the single player entity from our query. This will panic if there is more than one entity returned by the query. This is a good way to make sure that you don't accidentally have two instances of a player in the world. There is also a get variant which will return an option and not panic if you would like to do different logic depending on if there is two players or only one. We then check if any keys are pressed, the A and left. Otherwise, we check if D and right are pressed. If we want our character to move left, we need to decrement their X position by the movement speed times by frame time. This will result in the character moving left across the screen at a fixed speed, regardless of frame rate. If instead we want our character to move right, we increment our X position by the same amount. With how this logic is configured, if you're pressing left and right, the character will move to the left first. This will be important for when we add movement animations. If you now run your game, you can press the left and right arrow keys or A and D on your keyboard and your character will move left and right. If you change the constant player move speed, this will increase or decrease the speed that the player moves. Though you'll notice that the player's animation stays as idle while they are moving back and forth. We will correct this now. We need to make a system to change the player's animation. The system will take in a query for the texture atlas, sprite animation, and the atlas sprite, all with the player flag. We will then also take in our input again. Additionally, we'll need access to our texture atlas resource again, and the asset server, since we may be changing what animation is played, and we'll need to load the new animation. We will then deconstruct our single player animation into its constituent components. If the player has pressed any of the movement keys, we will set the walking animation. This is done the same way we set the idle animation when we first created our player. We will also need to zero its atlas. I have condensed this away so that I can have large text on a single frame. But you can get all this information from previous frames. We will then check if the player has just released any of the movement keys and is not currently holding a different movement key. We will set the idle animation. This needs to be done in this particular way so that if the player releases the left key while holding the right key, the animation does not change to idle and instead stays walking. We can check to see if the character just started pressing left. If so, we point the character left. Otherwise, if they just started pressing right, we point the character right unless they are currently pressing left. If the character lets go of left, we see if they are still pressing one of the other left keys or if they are pressing the right key. If so, we then make them face back to the right. This very complicated logic is required so that our character will face left when moving left and right when moving right, but won't flip which direction they are facing if they stop moving altogether. This allows for them to be facing to the left when they were walking left and then stopped in the idle animation. You can see all of this in this clip where the character will face to the left walking when I walk, face to the right walking when I walk right, and will stop and idle facing whichever direction I was walking last. The issue with the approach we just took is we create the animation every single time we change it. We're using the asset server to load up. This can result in sometimes the handle being unloaded because Bevy will get confused about which asset handle is currently strong because we are requesting a different one from the asset server. This can be slow and needlessly resource heavy since Bevy will unload the texture atlas when we swap to a different animation, despite the fact that we may immediately swap back to that texture atlas the next frame. To fix this problem, I'll make a player animation resource by deriving resource on a struct. This struct will contain a hash map. This hash map will use an enum to the animations as a key and a tuple of the texture atlas handle and the sprite animation component as its return type. This means I only need to declare an animation once, 
and I can request the handle and animation description using this system. This will prevent the animation unloading when nothing is using it, and also mean that I do not need to know whenever I call an animation how long the animation is, since this information is declared when loading the animation. I then implement from world on this animation, and inside its from world method, I create the player's animations with its new hash map, request the asset server from the world, create my two atlases like I did previously when I first created the player, request mutable access to the texture atlases resource, then insert my atlases that I just created in while adding them to the map with the corresponding key and animation information. I then return the player animation, which is inserted into the world. The player animation also has two helper functions added to it. Add, which lets me insert into the hash map, and get, which allows me to return an optional animation if it is loaded. The animation that I use as a key is simply an enum containing all the animations that derives hash partial and equals so that it can be used as a key in it, a hash map. This will, however, introduce a new method that needs to be called on your application. This is dot init resource, where you then provide the resource type. This will call the from world function on the resource. This method can also be used on any resource that implements default, since Bevy will automatically implement from world using the default implementation if it exists. Since we are initializing the resource this way, it will be available to us even in our startup function. So we can go back to our player spawning system and use the get idle animation to get access to our texture handle and sprite. I'll leave it up to anyone following along to go back and use this resource where they are currently creating the animations in place. Next, we'll be making it possible for our character to jump. I'll be doing this in a fairly obscure way just to show off certain ways to use components. In future, I'll use a physics engine to actually implement the jump. We will be implementing a component jump which contains an F32. This value will represent how much further up the player will travel before they start to fall back down, along with a constant fall speed, which I've spent to 98, which is just slightly higher than gravity in the real world, assuming one pixel is approximately 10 centimeters. In our jump system, we take in the system parameters, commands, a resource for time, their transform, and their jump power, along with the entity that the player is on, allowing us to remove the jump component if it is finished. We then use the get variant of single mute so that we can check to see if there is any player with jump. This means that if you don't have a jump component, this function will return and not move the player. We work out how much power to actually move the player by. We do this by taking the time since the last frame, multiplying it by the fall speed, timesing it by two, implying that we jump up twice the speed that we would fall down. We then min this value with how much jump is remaining, so that we will not jump above the jump height depending on frame boundaries. We then decrease our jump value by the jump power and increase our player's Y position by the jump power. If the remaining jump is now equal to zero, we call commands.entity on our player and remove the jump component. This will mean that in future, our player will not be jumping up. We then make a counterpart function to this, the player fall function. This function's the same, but doesn't need access to commands since it won't be removing a component and doesn't need access to the jump value. Instead, we change our query filter from just needing to be a player, but to being a player without the jump component. This means that while we are jumping up, we do not apply gravity, but once we are no longer jumping up, we apply gravity. This also requires a get single, since it is possible for our player to have a jump component and therefore not match the query. We then simply check to see if our player's Y position is greater than zero. If the player's height is greater than zero, however, we decrease it by the frame time multiplied by the fall speed. Then we check to make sure the player hasn't fallen below zero. If they have, we reset them back to zero. This will result in the player falling from any height above zero back to zero. And if they end up below the ground, teleporting back to ground height. As you can see in this clip, the player can now run back and forth and jump. In this clip, you can also see I've gone back and implemented the jump and fall animation. This is done by checking to see if the player's Y height is greater than zero for fall, and if the player has the jump component for jump. These two animations are checked before I check the walking animations so that you can move back and forth in the air without turning into the walking animations, but are still done independently of the left and right check so you can flip directions. Next, I'll add a very basic box collision system to implement physics into our game so we can add some platforms and have a true platformer by the end of this video.
The first step of this is to make a component hitbox. This takes in a vec2, which declares the size of the hitbox. Next, I make a function that takes in a hitbox and offset of one object and the hitbox and offset of the other object and returns whether these two objects have collided. This is done by getting half the width and height of the hitboxes. You can then check if the left edge of one object is greater than the right edge of the other and if the right edge of that object is less than the left edge of the other and doing the same in the y direction. This will tell you if the two boxes overlap and is a very simple and easy way to implement axis aligned box collision. With platforms, the player may not be at Y level zero when grounded. So we can no longer use this to check if the player is on the ground. So instead we implement the grounded component. This is a wrapper around a Boolean, true if the player is on the ground and false if not. I've implemented the grounded system using a local variable to show off more of Bevy's system parameters. A local variable keeps its state between frames. So what I do is I query for the player's transform and its grounded state. I then extract, I then compare the player's current Y position with its Y position from the previous frame. If they're the same, I say that the player is on the ground since they are obviously not moving downward. Otherwise I say it is false so that I can use Bevy's change detection elsewhere. If the player's current grounded state is different to the grounded state assigned, do I reassign it? I then can check if the player's grounded state has changed in my animation system to determine whether the player should be in falling or jumping position. We will, however, now need to actually create a platform for you to stand on. Otherwise, your player will just simply fall forever. This is done in a, another startup system called spawn map, which takes in the commands component. We will then spawn a sprite bundle nine pixels below the player. We will, get, we will give this sprite a custom size of 200 by 500. This makes the sprite expend 100 pixels in both in front and behind the player and give the platform a color of white so that it can be seen. We then also need to add a hitbox to this. We then add a hitbox to this component that is 200 by five. This will result in the player being able to stand on this hitbox. You can also add other platforms and obstacles into the world at this point by basically copying and placing this code but changing the sizes provided and positions. This is when you need to go back and change the falling and move player systems so that they use hitboxes rather than hard-coded coordinate systems. This is some code that you could use for this. You would query for all entities with a transform and a hitbox that are not the player. You would then want to calculate the player's new position after they move, then go through each hitbox and offset and check to see if this would result in the player colliding with a box. If so, return. Otherwise, you can move the player's position to this new position. This will result in the player not getting stuck inside hitboxes since they will not be able to move into the, though this could result in a small air barrier between the player and the hitbox if their movement speed is too high that they would be moving inside the box, that next frame. As you can see from this clip, now we have platforms that we can move around on and jump onto the boxes. All this works well and nicely with the animations all updating correctly and appropriately. This is what I'm going to call complete for a basic platformer. As an exercise for those following along, why don't you try implementing collectibles? These are the two components that I would recommend you implement to make collectibles easy and a function signature for collectibles. You will have to go back and modify other functions to, in order to make this work correctly. I've actually implemented this function along with the other changes that needed to be made to the game in order for it to work correctly in my GitHub. So if you try and implement this yourself, you can find the GitHub commit to see how I did it. I just figured this would be an interesting way for you to demonstrate that you have actually learned and understand the concepts provided in this video. This is what the game looks like once you get to the point of adding collectibles. Since you can run around the game and collect the strawberry, it will then move to a new position. And you I've also at this point added textures to the platforms. In the next episode, I'll use the Bevy Rapier plugin, Leaf Wing Input Manager, and Bevy ECS plugins, all in order to implement the functionality that I created in this video, but using pre-built plugins so that you have more advanced systems and functionality. In this video, I programmed the functionality that these plugins provide by hand to show you how to do it. This next video will focus more on how to use these specific plugins. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you'd like to support this channel on Patreon, the link can be found below. Also, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe so you don't miss future episodes, and I will see you then.